What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the off season at the HQ. More importantly, the juices are flowing. I'm gonna be hoeing all off season. Every Thursday, we'll be switching up the cadence. All right, like a good fucking producer out here. Just when you think you got us in your sights, we zone in and flip the script on you. Fade the Public's coming out on Fridays now. Every Thursday, I'm gonna be doing an individual video like this. So the content schedule going forward. I'm gonna link a timestamp here. If you don't give a shit about what I have to say for the next couple minutes and you just wanna get into the fantasy stuff, this thing right here, go here. Here's the content schedule going forward. Mondays, I will start with the behind the business of fantasy football interview series. I'm not sure when that's gonna start. It might be the end of January. It might be the early part of February. We'll have, as we usually do, Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers on for the first interview to kick off the season. Then we got a bunch of, bunch of other guests that have not been on the channel yet. He's just becoming a routine for me, being the first person. I just reach out and say, yo, Uncle Andy, let's talk some business. Let's hop on the channel. And he says, sure, because he's a good guy, a much better guy than me. Mondays are going to be behind the business where I interview one of the big influencers in the fantasy space. We talk nothing player related. We talk about business and marketing and branding and social media and interaction and the revenue. So if y'all are business minded, you will very much like that series. We've already done about three series. What's the plural of Siri? We've done three Siri of it. Tuesdays are my only open day thus far. I'm not sure what piece of content we're going to be putting out on Tuesday. Wednesday will continue to be bunk bed breakdowns, so that will be all dynasty related stuff. As you listened yesterday to Mike and Noah, sometimes I will be hopping on there with them, depending. They be fucking filming at like 11 p.m. at night most of the time. So I'm just like, listen, I get up early, I work throughout the entire day and then by like 10 p.m my energy levels are low and i don't want to give you low energy levels i want to be able to yell at you at all times okay if i'm not able to yell then i don't want to create that's the slogan that's the motto 2021 if you ain't got enough energy to yell at something or somebody then don't be doing that shit all right wednesdays dynasty thursdays season long video i don't want to oversaturate you obviously it's very 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 it's not even very early in the 2021 season it's literally still a 2020 season so we're going to stick with one redraft video per week but that is my creme de la creme that is my specialty just draft prep shit so every thursday we're going to be doing one season long focused video to help you ramp up and obviously as we get closer to the nfl draft in may and june hello we will be ramping that up to two maybe three maybe seven videos a week friday will be fade the public of course saturday will be our q and assault dynasty focused so if you're not a patreon member i suggest you go do that now and if you're looking to get into a dynasty league that is also how you do so patreon.com forward slash bdge sunday will be our new episodes of why you yell it podcast only no video focus for that so that's the content schedule today's first video as we always start this shit off with in the off season every off season we talk about the shit that we got wrong because we got a lot of it wrong today we're gonna do my top seven lessons learned my seven lessons learned not my top seven seven things that i learned from this fantasy season and i try to get in depth with them i tried to give y'all actionable advice to take away from because it's very easy to just say one or two things and be like oh i learned this but you didn't really learn anything that's just a trend that happened in the previous season and then next year something else is going to happen entirely and that lesson you think you learned is not relevant to the following year so we try to get in the grit and really take away things that i learned particularly okay so what i want y'all to do is in the comment section let me know some of the lessons that you guys learned from the 2020 fantasy football season obviously it was a shit show over year tons of injuries wild shit happened throughout the fantasy year so i can't say this is predictive of, of how we're going to operate moving forward but there are some key principles this is going to be some dynasty focus, some season long focus, some strategy, some specific player related. But these are things that I learned that I think I could pass on to y'all and hopefully help you guys going forward into the next season. Without further ado, I hate that sentence. I don't know why I said it. I need like a placeholder for that. Without further ado, no, let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling and let's eat. As I start every offseason with, I will say this. I'm going to get a whole lot of shit wrong throughout the next eight months, seven months, six months as we're prepping for our drafts. I'm going to get a whole lot of shit wrong. But so are you, okay? We're all going to get shit wrong. I'm going to say something. You guys are going to go into the comment section and say, this is so stupid. What the fuck are you doing? How do you have people that follow you on YouTube? And I'm going to be like, bitch, I don't really know either, to be honest. But 
y'all are here. So I try to do my best for you guys, but it's important to note that I know I'm going to get a whole lot of shit wrong. And I know you're going to get a whole lot of shit wrong. We play fantasy for fun. I don't have a lot of fun doing it, but supposedly I'm supposed to say that. And supposedly you're supposed to be playing fantasy for fun. It just brings me a lot of anxiety, but that's neither here nor here. I'm going to get a whole lot of shit wrong. Pick the guys you like, but have good reasoning behind it. I thought it appropriate to start this list off with Miles Sanders, my baby boy, Miles Sanders. If you listen to me and you went all in on Miles Sanders first round, I apologize. Flat out bust. We can make all the excuses we want for him, which I will in about six minutes. But at the end of the day, the way I look at busts is this. If you look back and you had the same exact number pick that you had earlier in the summer, would you take that player again? I don't care if you could say, oh, he had great yards per carry. Oh, he got injured. If that didn't happen, X, Y, Z, would you make the pick again? Would you do it again? If the answer is no, pretty much a bust. Okay. I took Miles Sanders in one league, one redraft league this year, happened to be the most televised league in YouTube, the E-Town get down. So y'all saw that. He was my first pick. Took him at the 110, 10-man league. I was the last pick in the, in the first round. I ended up going 12-2. and two. I ended up being first place regular season. I ended up missing the scoring title by like 11 points, okay? Knocked out by Snacks in the semis. Didn't want to tear up on a Thursday morning. So we're not going to want to listen to fucking Snacks yell about something. Listen to Fade the Public tomorrow. All that to say, one player is not going to kill you, but this normally would. Your first round pick is a really, really big miss. And I want to talk about Sanders. I want to talk about the takeaways from Sanders. I did get let off the hook with Sanders busting because if you look at the rest of the picks, these were the first 14 picks this year in the E-Town Get Down draft. They were all running backs. We had C-Mac number one, bust. Saquon, bust. Zeke, bust. Henry, goat. C-H, bust. Dalvin, goat. Mixon, bust. Kamara, goat. Jacobs, eh. You know, he finished as the RB8, but like wasn't a, definitely wasn't like a championship piece on your team. Sanders, bust. Eckler, bust from injuries. Drake was okay down the stretch. Chubb, really good, but missed five games. James Conner, bust so obviously they were watching my videos this summer and everyone's like we gotta go running backs we gotta go running backs we gotta go running backs and everybody took a fucking running back almost all of the first 14 running backs were busts outside of like three or four on top of that you look at the wide receivers that were picked right michael thomas the clear wide receiver one also a bust julio jones the wide receiver three played in like nine games okay so the first two entire two rounds were basically littered with busts no matter where you went we had busts we had injuries we had frauds we had farces everywhere you fucking look this was like a crime documentary it was basically like anyone in your league that hit on three of their first four picks was in this was in the playoffs all you had to do was like hit on 60 percent of your early picks and you were probably just a shoe into the playoffs just because everybody's team was fucking bowing out left and right so what is the lesson here first i want to touch on one of the videos we go all the way back to probably one of my better videos that i made this summer it was how to spot or draft a league winning running back and what i defined a league winning running back at the time was a running back that averages over 20 fantasy points per game throughout the course of the season half ppr so if your running back's averaging over 20 fantasy points per game through the course of the season he is someone that legitimately to get you into the playoffs if they're a little bit higher up on that scale they're probably gonna win you the league so we looked at all of them over the last 10 years there were 20 of them and we broke down the similarities the differences what made up a fantasy running back that was a league winning running back I'll, I'll link that that video in the description if you want to go watch it to get like a better feel of what i was talking about but very loosely we define the following criteria that the running back is going to catch 50 passes he's going to be on a top 12 scoring offense and he's going to uh, run behind a top 12 run blocking offensive line those aren't the three black and white criteria but the closer you are to those three things happening or the higher up on the spectrum you are for those different aspects the more likely you are to be a league winning running back so you don't have to catch 50 passes but if you're on a top 12 you know top two scoring offense the top two offensive run blocking line that will probably sway enough in your favor that you can be a league winning running back okay so we did the calculations this summer and based on our formula based on the things that we did in that video the top four identified running backs that we said had the highest likelihood of being league winning running backs this year that hadn't already done it so we took c-mac out we took saquon out because they had already met that criteria and they had already seasons of 20 plus fantasy points the top four that we identified this year that were most likely to be league winning running backs that did not do it already in their career dalvin cook derrick henry miles sanders aaron jones cook and henry both did it this year averaged over 20 fantasy points per game aaron jones was very close 17 fantasy points per game we had a couple more touchdowns what happened rb5 overall sanders was the one that missed there few things here when that video came out the projected upside for both Sanders and that Philadelphia offense was very high. The video came out, I think it was like early July or something like that. So obviously there was that two month stretch between early July and when fantasy drafts actually kicked off where a lot of things could happen. And a lot of fucking things did happen in Philadelphia from there. 
I did not waver on Sanders. He was just, th this is where I'm talking about going, having fun in fantasy. All of the news that came out from Philly and Sanders from that point on were negatives to his outlook. But he was a guy I wanted. He was a guy I believed in, and I just didn't waver from it. I went Stevie Wonder to it, and I'm like, I'm taking Miles Sanders regardless. Completely my fault, and I acknowledge that for sure. One, their offensive line sustained a ton of injuries, massive injuries, lengthy injuries to some of their best players, right? And what that would do to the formula, I mean, this there it's not only like a feel thing, but when we're looking back at that formula, top 12 run blocking, top 12 offensive scoring, and a guy who can catch 50 passes. That would push, right, the injuries to the offensive line would push that run blocking part of the formula, the run blocking line, down a little bit and would make him less likely to hit that upside, right? And we, we draft for upside. We draft for running backs that will be league winners because the other positions don't really offer that. The offensive line injuries happened. I didn't budge. Then Sanders ended up suffering his multi-week injury. It was mid to late August. And as I preach every summer, this is something... You know, if you want to go watch, I, I would go back, you know, if you're if you're new to the channel or you like you find this kind of video interesting. I do this at the start of every offseason and I don't reiterate. I'm not going to reiterate some of the best lessons that I've learned over the last few years. I just want to talk about the ones I've learned for this year. But I've learned a lot of good ones over the last like two or three years as I've refined myself as a good fantasy player. One of the things we always preach is don't find injuries in fantasy football. They will find you. Don't draft injured players going into the year. You're going to deal with injuries throughout the season. And this was clear cut from Miles Sanders. I still didn't waver. If you go bike, I even started a bunch of the videos towards the end of the summer after he was hurt after the offensive line. And I was like, it's probably ignorant of me to continue to promote Miles Sanders. But listen, this is why you play fantasy football. And I want to have him on at least one of my teams. All those things happened. And I continue to like Miles Sanders, even though I shouldn't. I acknowledge that. If I have a guy that I like this offseason and his offensive line starts going to shit, he gets hurt right before the season. He misses week one. Like that was all part of it. I was like, fuck it. And if you could acknowledge that and be like, yeah, I still want to take him. Good for you. But if you want to play logically sound fantasy football, these are some of the pitfalls that you need to be looking for and accounting for when you're looking at these league winning upside type running backs. Here, here, here's the other thing. Like the people that did it on that process. Good. People that faded Sanders because, you know, Doug Peterson was there and it was going to be a running back by committee. False. Fake news. Like you lost in that process bet. Right. Sanders saw 216 opportunities in 11 and a half games. Right. He pulled up on that long ass run against. I don't remember if it was Baltimore or Pittsburgh, but he missed the full second half. So 11 and a half games, 216 opportunities. That's about 19 opportunities a game. He was on pace for 72 plus targets. This was not a, a committee whatsoever in Philadelphia. His efficiency metrics were very good by himself. His yards per carry were top five for the second year in a row. Yards per touch overall, number seven amongst NFL running backs. Yards created per touch, number nine. This dude is going to put it all together one year. I hope he starts going in like the third and fourth rounds of redraft leagues next year because I will fucking pounce bike on it. The receiving work, you know, he was on pace for 72 plus targets the receiving work was terrible though a ton of his targets were uncatchable because Carson Wentz was terrible and he dropped a ton of them he was second in the NFL amongst running backs with drops he had like eight drops this year so wasn't doing himself any favor but he had a 50 catch rookie season so in terms of that formula of league winning upside shit like he was very much in the category for having 50 plus catches as a, as a part of his you know outcome I, he can he can obviously do that is what I'm saying but overall fading him for being a committee was wrong fading him for for having a broken offensive line and then Carson Wentz being broken would have been the right process. The takeaway here is we want to shoot for league winning running backs in the first few rounds, but use a strict set of parameters and don't move the goalposts because you like a guy. Okay. That is takeaway number one. I promise all of these won't be as long as that, but Miles Sanders was the guy that I spent the most time on in the off season. And I felt like I had to address for the most time in this video. Also, my screen is completely black. And I'm recording this through the camera for the first time, not through the software. So I pray to God. I pray to the fantasy gods. Miles Sanders, if you do anything for me, please make this happen. I hope this video works. Number two on this list. And this is in no particular order. These aren't like the most important or like any organ organized way whatsoever. I literally don't care about your evaluations on quarterbacks. I don't care about NFL teams evaluations. I don't care about the guy on Twitter who has the single most followers evaluations. I don't care about an NFL scouts evaluations. I don't care. I, I care equally about my mother's quarterback evaluations as I do your mother's quarterback evaluations as I do the GM of an NFL franchise's quarterback evaluations because nobody on Twitter in the world anywhere knows how to evaluate quarterbacks when it comes to their success at the NFL level. Literally nobody. I will be doing, and I, this is not hyperbole, I will be doing zero scouting of rookie quarterbacks, and I will invest on them 
I will invest into them based on draft capital and based on, honestly, doesn't even need draft capital. I will just be investing in quarterbacks blindly, okay? L let me make my point. We had Josh Allen a few years ago, wildly erratic, inaccurate, can't be good. We had Justin Herbert this year, erratic, can't be good, day and night, Mitchell Trubisky 2.0, et cetera, et cetera. I will never again fade first round drafted quarterbacks because I think they're not good. My personal opinion of their of them of their status coming into NFL will not affect how I draft them in leagues. While the majority of like later quarterbacks drafted in the NFL draft later don't hit, the majority of hits were fades at some level in the NFL or at some level in their career, okay? Look at all of the elite quarterbacks in the NFL. Look at all of the good quarterbacks. We'll look at a, a, a sample of almost basically the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Russell Wilson, third round pick in the NFL draft, sixth quarterback off the board in the 2012 NFL draft. If you listen to people on Twitter, if you listen to NFL scouts, you probably would have just faded him in your rookie drafts. Aaron Rodgers, he sat in that green room. He fell to the 24th pick, was the second quarterback taken in 2005. Jordan Love, the same exact franchise with their first round pick this year, took Jordan Love. For two picks later than Aaron Rodgers was picked. People are going to be making fun of that Jordan Love pick, wouldn't touch him in super flex drafts, and I bet their attitude is going to change in a couple years. Tom Brady, obviously six rounder in 2000. Justin Herbert, didn't fall far, but he was the third quarterback off the board. We were told he was easily the, the worst of the three. He's looking like the best right now. 2008, the Bills drafted Josh Allen. Everyone said that he was going to be huge bust. Third quarterback off the board. Most people believe that Josh Allen or Josh Rosen, who was picked two spots behind him, was better. And most people thought Josh Allen, that was the wrong pick. They thought Josh Allen was the fourth best quarterback of that group in the same draft. Who else do we have as the fifth quarterback off the board? Last pick of the first round, your reigning MVP, Lamar Jackson. In a super flex rookie draft, in a super flex rookie draft, for those of y'all getting into dynasty, quarterbacks, quarterbacks, quarterbacks that come at values in the rookie draft are crucial, okay? Him being the fifth quarterback off the board, plus other skill players obviously involved, probably pushed Lamar Jackson to the late first round, early second round of rookie drafts. And now you can't even get him late first round, early second round of startup drafts with every fucking player in the pool right now. One year prior to that, wasn't there a team that did something really stupid? Mitchell Trubisky was drafted second overall. Patrick Mahomes fell to 10. Deshaun Watson fell to 12. My point being here is this. I promise you that when you're talking about evaluating quarterbacks, you have absolutely zero fucking idea what you're talking about because these NFL people who do it for a living that do it nonstop don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So you're a guy who watched like two highlight plays of Justin Fields or some shit. These guys are going to come in. If they could run the ball, if they could throw the ball, there's no reason to fade them if they're getting first round draft capital. And even later in the drafts, you might as well take the shots on them because everybody's so fucking good at being so fucking bad at evaluating quarterbacks. Like almost every good quarterback, that whole list, and I could have, I could have get, kept going. Basic, that whole list, almost every good quarterback was faded at some point. Maybe they didn't drop really far in the draft, but they weren't the first quarterback picked in that draft. And that translates to fantasy because people start hearing these narratives. Like I did it with Herbert last year. Like there was no way I was drafting Justin Herbert just because I thought he was inaccurate and he was going to bust. So you start completely fading these quarterbacks, even though they fall to really good values in your drafts. This is more tailored toward dynasty players and those playing in super flex dynasty leagues, which is the only type of dynasty league you should be playing in. Invest in quarterbacks and super flex and dynasty. Do it often. More often than not, they are not waste of picks and they're almost always more valuable in trades than when you have to draft them. Okay. Numero three, getting shit done without anybody else on the field is a positive, not a negative. And here's like the underlying title to that. Volume for a player in fantasy comes from being the only option. Efficiency with that volume comes from being good. One really big miss I had a couple years ago was expecting Juju Smith-Schuster to take a huge jump up when Antonio Brown left. Obviously, that didn't happen. He was not good the following year. Ben was injured, et cetera. You know, there were different factors at play, but he was just not good. That's a big red flag. You take a, a look at a few guys this year. Calvin Ridley, absolutely dominant with Julio Jones in the lineup, without Julio Jones in the lineup. If he's on the field, it didn't matter. Calvin Ridley was going nuts. Again, volume comes from being the only option. Efficiency on that volume comes from being a good player. And this is a good lesson for me because I'm thinking about a guy like Brandon Ayuk, right? He was great without Kittle and Debo on the field. Volume comes from being the only option. Being good on that volume comes from 
being good. So when I'm looking at next year, all of the analysis on Brandon Ayuk is going to be like, ah, I'm going to fade him because he did all his damage without Debo and George Kittle. Was he purely a volume guy? No, he was really fucking good. So for me, I already know like that's going to be the argument in my head. Like, ah, can he do it with Debo? Can he do it with Kittle? I'm I'm definitely not going to just be fading Brandon Ayuk for the sake of saying, oh, he could only do it with those guys off the field. Obviously, the last game of the season didn't look good because he didn't play a good game because George Kittle was out there, et cetera. But that was CJ Bethard and Bethard. I'll never be able to get that name right. The overall point being here is like, don't fade players. If a player shows you that they're good, they're probably good. And we're looking at efficiency metrics. And, and this is where it comes from like Darren Waller. I pumped up Darren Waller all off season. More luckily, like me and Mike were talking about making sure that you grab Darren Waller and Dynasty all off season. We were very high in him coming into 2020. And everyone said, you know, he was only good because Oakland didn't have anyone else to throw the ball to. Then they drafted Henry Ruggs and Brian Edwards and Lynn Bowden. They drafted all these rookies and Darren Waller's volume and targets and all this shit is going to come down. But when you look at what he did in 2019, yes, he had a lot of volume and maybe some of that came because he was the only player on the field. He was amazing on that volume. All of his efficiency metrics were incredible, like top three, top five at the position, telling you that he's good regardless of the volume. He's good with small volume, he's good with high volume, which means he's going to be good Regardless, he's not just a stat compiler. And we got a lot of people out here deleting replies and shit on this. So we've got the three lessons so far. We have Miles Sanders. Obviously, don't adjust the goalposts because you like a player. Stick to your strategy. Understand what you're looking for in a player. If you like the player and you just want to say, fuck, I'm going to roll the dice, roll with it, man. That's what fantasy football is about, having fun. Number two, I literally don't give a fuck about your player evaluations on quarterbacks. Invest them early, invest in them often in Superflex Dynasty Leagues. Number three, getting it done without anybody is a positive, not a negative. Volume comes from being the only option. Efficiency comes from being good. Number four, just wide receivers on new teams in general, right? One of the most popular narratives all offseason was the movement of really good wide receivers because we saw a lot of that was that these guys can't be good on new teams, right? And I was someone that pushed this narrative. Well, while the narrative works more often than not, 2020 was a big not. Nah. Stefan Diggs comes in, absolutely lights the fucking league on fire, sets career highs across the board, finishes at fantasy's wide receiver three behind Adams and Hill, leads the NFL in targets and receptions and receiving yards. Now, while no one expected like Josh Allen to take this jump and, and do what he did in 2020, it was always in the range of outcomes that Diggs saw an absurd number of targets and being the first time he operated as an alpha and the fact that John Brown the year prior at age like 30 went off for a thousand yards in this same offense, like why couldn't Diggs do the same and be way better on that? And I'm pissed at myself and I tweeted this yesterday because this is what I was actually saying when the move first happened and he went to Buffalo and I was like, listen, bro, this is the first time that Diggs gets to actually opera. I'm just going to put the motherfucking clip on here and be like, damn. If Diggs, oh, okay, so look at it this way. Like Diggs was in Minnesota, right? Like right. he was sharing the ball with Adam Thielen. Like Adam Thielen and Dalvin Cook are both <clears throat> very, uh, incredible playmakers in the NFL. Yes, very He good. goes to Buffalo and immediately becomes the alpha athlete in that offense. Like there's no one that should be game plan to get the ball over him. So he goes there. There's no reason why he shouldn't command 140 targets. It's not unreasonable. You would think it minimum. Last year, he went off for uh, over 1,100 yards. Guess how many targets uh, uh, Stefan Diggs got last year? Like 1,130 80, yards. 85. 90. 94. 109. 93. Oh, wow. He only got bad. 93 targets. Like, he could fucking ball. If he ball. goes from 93 to 145 next year, even if some of them are in that, you're going you to figure put, at can least 40. Of, this is a situation 10 yards where, over his head. But the fact that he's becoming the alpha, I mean, I just feel like they're going to game plan that offense around him. They've been looking for a one for yeah. Josh Allen. And I just they I got him. could see the volume really going up. So people will immediately be like, ah, it's Buffalo, Josh Allen, inaccurate. I think if you dig a little deeper, like the volume game is one you could play here. Listen, John so, Brown was also really good with Josh John Allen. John Brown was great last year. Twitter really fucked me up because you just hear these narratives over and over and over again all summer. And you're like, Ugh, maybe I'm I'm fading the public so fucking hard that my take is actually kind of silly, right? It's ridiculous that I need to switch gears. And that's what I did on Diggs, unfortunately. So we look at Diggs. He disproved it. We look at D-Hop. I was hands off on D-Hop, and that was obviously just a straight L. Oh, he still wasn't really winning you chips if you drafted him in early second round or whatever. I would still go with a top running back over a wide receiver runs up you know, averaging like 14, 14 and a half fantasy points per game. Regardless, regardless, D-Hop was a baller. Plenty, plenty of big games. He had plenty of bad games too, actually, when you look at the consistency and shit. But we're not here to, to drill in on D-Hop. We're more here to say that he proved us wrong. Regardless, the takeaway here is just don't throw a blanket ass statement over any general position or circumstance. You have to be looking at 
everything individually. Otherwise, whatever you're saying probably comes off wildly ignorant. Also, anytime the entire industry is getting behind one blanket statement like that, you know it's the absolute wrong move, okay? The easiest thing in the world is just to fade what in the entire fantasy Twitter talks about all summer because they're never fucking right. Number five has to do with rookie wide receiver. We had five separate rookie wide receivers finish as top 33 fantasy wide receivers. And here, here's what I want to say for, for this one, just a general overall kind of strategy thing. When you make, I, I implore you to be very detailed or not detailed, but at least do your research and come away with actionable takeaways. Like if you're going to make your own list of things that you learned this year, rookie wide receivers, the takeaway here is not going to be, oh, they can be good. Like that doesn't help anybody because there was plenty of rookie wide receivers that were bad this year. And does that mean you want to be drafting all rookie wide receivers and redraft? No, it doesn't. So I implore you to figure out like what actionable device can you take away that actually helps you next year. So when we look at the, the rookie wide receivers, as I said, five of them finish as top 33 fantasy wide receiver. We have Jefferson, we have Claypool, we have CeeDee Lamb, we have T. Higgins, we have Brandon Ayuk. When you look at where these guys were drafted, we had Lamb. I went back and looked at the preseason ADPs. Lamb, 90 overall wide receiver, 37. The next three after him were Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Rager, Ayuk. 139 at wide receiver 54. It was only that high because we knew Debo's foot was a problem and Ayuk was going to operate as the one. Justin Jefferson was pick 157, wide receiver 57. The next three were Chenault, Brian Edwards, Michael Pittman. Higgins and Claypool both went undrafted. The narrative all offseason is going to be like, don't be scared to draft rookie wide receivers. And to be honest, I still don't think that's the takeaway here. I don't think drafting rookie wide receivers in redraft in season long leagues is good. My takeaway here is this. If the last few years have showed us anything, it's that rookie wide receivers need to be your absolute number one priority on the waiver wire as soon as they show the glimpse. What happens is those rookie wide receivers typically get drafted very late in redraft leagues, right? Like, as I said, a lot of those guys went undrafted. A lot of them were like picks 140 to 170. A lot of them don't get on the field immediately. They're playing like 30 to 40% of the snaps weeks, one, two, three, whatever they don't produce. Those are the first time, the first guys that people drop on their roster, right? They like to take a flyer because they've been hearing buzz about them for three, four months or whatever. These we, we all get real excited about rookies and then they don't produce right away. And you're just like, ah, fuck it. Maybe he's not that good. But once they do show you that glimpse of talent, that glimpse of fantasy goodness, once you see that glimpse of sunlight, once there's even the slightest slip of a titty comes out the bra, you squeeze. And of course, there are going to be exceptions where a rookie wide receiver starts, you know, he's he is someone who's drafted and he starts well off the gate. And, and that's, you know, that's up to you to draft him. But there's almost always a pickup window right at the beginning of the season, right? Like Justin Jefferson was out with COVID. He was running as the wide receiver three in practice. He didn't do anything in weeks one and two. He was the wide receiver three on the Minnesota Vikings in terms of snaps and stuff. And then he exploded in week three. And my waiver wire video for that week was like literally the first 20 minutes was Jeff, Justin Jefferson. I went back and watched the game. I was like, this dude is unbelievable. And I was listening to other fantasy podcasts and I was like, yeah, I don't know if he could like be consistent. Like with Adam Thielen there, I'm like, yo, Justin Jefferson is a baller. So if you listen to my waiver wire week three, I was like, he needs to be number one priority. Chase Claypool went undrafted most likely. If he didn't, he was probably dropped after week one because he had like 35 yards. Week two, three for 88 and a touchdown. You saw the glimpse. You saw how good he looked on the field. The rest is history. T. Higgins didn't even play in week one. In week two, not a big stat line, but the little minuscule things, six targets. He played over A.J. Green. He had more snaps. Should have been assigned to pick up. And if you didn't, you look at week three, nine targets, scores two touchdowns over his next nine games. He goes over 62 yards and or scores a touchdown in eight of those nine games. OK, so again, I'm not saying it's always wise to draft rookie wide receivers, but once you see that little slim hope of breakout from them, they need to be the priority on the waiver wire. You look at, you know, Terry McLaurin last year. You look at A.J. Brown last year, like they showed you off the rip that they're going to be fantasy producers. Do not wait the week and say, eh, you know what? I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's worth investing into. It is. We don't know what they are, but as soon as they show us who they are in the NFL field, they are worth getting on your team, which segues into number six. We talk about worth getting on your team. This is dynasty related. It is always, 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 always worth rostering the preseason buzz running backs. And I added this in later in the blog, tight ends. It is hard to come by running backs in Dynasty, right? Their trade value is sky high. You can pretty much only replenish them through the rookie draft. And the problem is everybody likes rookie. You know, if anything about their collegiate profile is likable, they're going to be going too high in rookie draft. So like, unless you have draft capital, unless you're okay spending more draft capital than you should on running backs, it is very hard to replenish them outside of having top 
picks. When running backs start getting buzz in the preseason, no matter how little, no matter how insignificant, 98% of the time, these guys are not going to hit. But on the off chance that one of them does, the juice is 1,000% worth thy squeeze. And the first one that comes to mind is obviously James Robinson. He was like a league changer if you picked him up in the preseason when we heard a little bit of buzz about him. But the dude that I'm actually referring to from this summer that I personally thought of was J.D. McKissick, okay? Another guy. So you had like two very good pickups this year in the offseason from some preseason buzz. In the GoFame Dynasty League, congrats, Scott, my most important Dynasty League this year. I can't say McKissick was straight up my best player on like a raw level, but he was probably my most valuable player down the stretch. When I was dealing with injuries from Eckler and C-Mac and Nick Chubb, Tyreek Hill's late bye week, like McKissick filled in and kept putting me up 15, 16, 18 points, man. He was literally the fucking GOAT. That 35-yard touchdown catch that he had in week 16 won me the championship. If he didn't catch that at the end of the game, I beat Scott by four. I don't win that game if he doesn't do that. Wide receivers are a dime a dozen dynasty. This is the big takeaway, I guess, here. You'll almost never be able to not pick up a guy off the waiver wire and play him in your wide receiver slot. That's almost never the case for running back. You can always get him at wide receiver. They might not have a good week, right? It's not always promise or be on a great passing offense or whatever, but you'll be able to find a starter. If you look at the NFL, there are a lot of starting wide receiver. Every team has like two or three. Some of those guys are going to be on the waiver wire. For running backs, you barely have a handful of running backs that are startable in fantasy. And we'll get to that in the next point. And that's why you need to be all over the running back. And this rule is actually kind of twofold. And I'd even say it's almost more prevalent when you look at tight ends. Like you look at Logan Thomas and Robert, Robert Tunyon this year. You look at Darren Waller from last year. When you hear buzz, don't be late, okay? Like treat that fucking buzz that you're hearing like an alarm clock and do not hit snooze on it. What I think is an interesting strategy that I saw on, on Twitter, I forget who said it, but like maybe reserve a set number of spots on your roster, like one to three spots on your dynasty roster, assuming you have like a 28 or 30 team roster that you use as like a carousel for these buzz guys throughout the summer. Right? Use it specifically for rostering them, right? Like someone gets hype, you pick them up and let them sit there for a little while. If he continues to get hype, obviously you hold on to him. If he doesn't and you hear hype from somebody else, maybe you carousel him out, you drop him and you grab somebody new for that, but continue to feed on the hype. As soon as you hear it, it's you're not giving up a lot. You're giving up some shitty roster spot for the chance of having an upside guy like an RB2 of JD McKissick or an RB1 of James Robinson. And this happens a lot in Dynasty. It's so hard to hit on tight ends in Dynasty, right? Like people will use first round draft picks hoping that they can get some kind of return within the first three years. When if you just grab Robert Tanyan off the waiver wire this year in the summer, whenever he was getting buzzed, I don't even know if he was getting buzzed until earlier into the season. You got literally the tight end three in fantasy this year. So running backs and tight ends, be first. Literally, if you ain't first, you're last, okay? I've never heard a more prevalent slogan to go with this lesson. Always worth rostering the preseason buzz, running backs and tight ends in Dynasty. And my last point here, my last point here, and this is pretty much something that I will say to you guys in every video each year, year in, year out. The market will always reset itself and there's always value to be had. Looking back on this year personally, we went crazy on running backs in drafts early, often, and early. And it kind of might have bit you in the ass. One, because everybody was doing it, so it was hard to get any value. But on the flip side, because everybody was doing it, it might not have actually bit you in the ass because all the running backs busted. Again, whenever the entire market is doing something, it's probably best practice to fade. And that's on me for shitting where I eat all summer. This is a video from my pre-draft strategy, like right before drafts kicked off, maybe like September 5th, that I think was something I knew was going to happen. But like, I'm glad I could look back on it and say like, yeah, it definitely happened. But based on the way the NFL is set up right now, based on the way fantasy football is set up right now, we have a lot of workhorse running backs at our disposal. We don't have a lot of high-end elite wide receiver production coming out of almost anywhere right now in the NFL. We could look at it in one of two ways. We could say last year was a bit fluky, and I do think statistically it was a very down year for wide receivers, especially high-end ones. I've dropped this stat before, but Michael Thomas was the only wide receiver to go over 1,400 receiving yards last year. That is tied for the lowest amount of single-season 1,400-yard receivers over the last 25 years. On the flip side, 25 receivers had a thousand or more receiving yards last year, which was the highest number of the last 25 years, tied with, I think, like 1999 or some shit. Point being is we're going into this year thinking, oh, wide receiver's so deep, but we don't have a lot of high-end talent. 
Now, I think that is going to come down to the market level, where we do have more 1,400-yard receivers this year. The wide receiver two to three range, we're not going to have as many 1,000-yard receivers. And then next year, going into the drafts, we're going to be saying something like, okay, well, wide receiver's not as deep. You still want to hammer them, but you want to get one or two good ones early. Something like that, right? The, the market always adjusts itself. The market is the market is the market and slaps you in the face every single year so in 2019 we had like a billion thousand yard wide receivers and it led us to believe that the position was unbelievably deep without any high-end production one of my favorite quotes if you're chasing numbers you're looking backwards naturally the market reset itself right that 25 was the 25 year high this year we had 16 wide receivers go over a thousand yards so next year we're going to go into the drafts and people are going to be like exactly as i said Oh, there are elite wide receivers now on the top and the middle rounds aren't as great, aren't as deep. This shit is so predictable. You look on the flip side, 2020 is literally the second time in the last 30 years that we only had two players run for 1,200 yards. So we're looking at the wide receivers getting high-end production, but we're not having a lot of running backs getting a lot of high-end production. I know a lot of you guys are going to say like, oh, did it switch off into the passing work? And of course, you know, a lot of it is moving towards the passing work. But I'm just saying there is a lot more rushing production in the previous years when you think of running backs. The other year over the last 30 years that only had two players run for 1,200 yards, 2015. Y'all remember what happened after 2015 in those 2016 drafts? Everybody went wide receiver early, often. There were people, myself included probably, went like four wide receivers off the rips. Those people did not win their leagues. People that didn't take that strategy won their leagues i think we're going to see the exact same thing in 2021 where people are a little bit more pushing towards that wide receiver we're going to see a lot more wide receivers go in the first round we're going to see a lot more wide receivers go in the second round people are going to be going after Devonte adams really early we're going to get tyree kill really early we're going to get the guys like the breakouts the dk metcalfs the justin jeffersons all those guys calvin Ridley's. they're all going to be fluctuating into the second round and this is where I think we stockpile running backs. Be a historian and you'll be a champion. We obviously picked a brutal year to go all in on running backs, but that's exactly what happened in 2015, people. Like all of the first round running backs either got old or busted. We're seeing the same thing. And because we're now going to be able to get them at value, right? This is going to be the thing all of you're hearing it from me now. And I've actually, I said this in my streams, like in week 15, I was like, I already know what's going to fucking happen next year. But you're going to you're going to hear this narrative all summer now. You're going to hear how you need to go wide receivers. And then you're going to hear some sharp people be like, no, we're going right fucking bike to the well on running backs. This is going to be the year I think you start because now you're going to be able to get workhorses in the second, in the third, in the fourth round. You're going to be able to start off the rip with first, second, third round workhorse running backs. They're going to be at better value in drafts this year than they were last year because the overall strategy of picking running backs was never based on individual players. It wasn't like we have so many really good workhorse running backs, in my opinion. Some people did that. The reason we're going running backs early and often is because the positional scarcity is so much greater at running back than wide receiver, okay? Like I said before, every NFL team has two to three viable fantasy wide receivers. Again, they're not all going to be fucking amazing. They're not going to be league winning guys, but you could plug them into your lineup. Whereas not every team even has a single fantasy viable running back. So you're looking at like 25 guys that you might feel comfortable plugging in, but wide receivers, there's like 60 to 70, right? The numbers are simple here. And now we can actually get them at value rather than having to pay upwards price of hitting that strategy. So I think next year's fantasy leagues are going to be ripe for the taking those are the seven top lessons i think i learned in 2020 i probably learned about 7,000 more but i wanted to try to keep this concise but as you see we get in the grit we get in the muck here and this is what i think you can expect from my videos in the off season i get time to really like do the research and get thorough i know throughout the actual regular season sometimes we kind of push through things really quickly just because there's you know you got to evaluate 120 players every single week within a period of like five hours so it's very hard to get this in depth but this is why i love the off-season content because I get to sit down and I get to focus on like one singular thing that I can go really fucking deep into and chill with y'all for that. So let me know which lessons you've learned in this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful learning foundational year of 2020. I'm excited to, to start off another off season with y'all. If you enjoyed the video, do the thing that people that do YouTube tell you to do. Hit the fucking button that looks like that. If you're listening via audio, uh, podcasts and rating and review and all that shit would be wildly appreciated. But drop a comment on, on the lessons you've learned because I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what things we all fucked up together. Okay, I hope this video worked. I feel like it probably did. If it didn't, I hate my life because I'll do it again because I love you guys. All right, I'm out.